In the headlines, a reshuffle gets underway with President Park Geun-hye nominating a new prime minister. It's the slowest economic growth in more than two years. After five straight quarters of growth below 1%, Korea could be falling into a low growth trap. Yemen in chaos. The president, the prime minister and the cabinet have all stepped down, leaving the country without a leader as rebels take over. These stories and more on Early Edition at 6. It's 6 p.m. on a Friday here in Korea, live from Seoul. This is Daniel Chef, early edition at 6. And I'm Lee Ji-yoon, and thanks for joining us tonight. We begin at the nation's top office. With hopes of turning the page, President Park Geun-hye is making changes. And she began by nominating a new prime minister this morning. Our presidential office correspondent, Choi yoo sun starts us off. President Park has nominated the ruling party's floor leader, Lee wan gu as her new prime minister. E, a three-term lawmaker, is thought to have gotten the president's nod for how he negotiated thorny issues with the opposition as floor leader in the past year. The nominee fully understands President Park's policy direction and has closely cooperated with the opposition to restore parliamentary proceedings. He's the right person to carry through the economic innovation plan, public sector reforms, and communicating with and working for the public. Friday's nomination was widely expected after the president retained Prime Minister Chung Hong won last year, despite his resignation to take responsibility for the government's botched handling of the Sewolho ferry disaster. While he needs to get parliamentary approval to take office, there's been no announcement yet on the nominee for the vacant seat of Ocean's minister. In a likely response to her approval ratings plunging to 30 percent following allegations of her aides abusing power and disorder within her office, President Buck reduced authority of some of her longtime aides. But her chief of staff, the one many watchers had speculated will be dismissed, is going to stay put for now. Instead, the president has named a new senior policy coordination secretary, Hyun Jung Tech, to better coordinate her policies inside the presidential office. President Buck also announced a new lineup of four special advisors whose main task will be to actively communicate the president's policies with parliament. Meanwhile, President Buck's civil affairs secretary was promoted to senior secretary after his former boss, Kim Young-han, resigned, having refused to appear at a parliamentary hearing for a recent document leak scandal. Choi yoo sun Arirang News. Staying with that story, the new prime minister nominee, Mr. Lee Wan-gu, made a confident statement. Yes, he promised to speed up the country's economic recovery if he's confirmed as prime minister. Our National Assembly correspondent, Park Ji-won, has the story. Speaking to reporters right after the presidential office of Cheung Wa Dae made the announcement, the three-term lawmaker said his top priority is improving the economy and the livelihoods of the people. He also stressed the importance of communicating with the opposing political camps and vowed to carry out necessary reforms. The 65-year-old politician also said he'd be direct and honest with the president. I believe a good prime minister should not hesitate to be honest and forthright with the president. I will try to be a prime minister that speaks his mind, even if what I say is critical of the president. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy welcomed the nomination, complementing the seasoned politician's mediation skills and willingness to communicate with opposing parties. Those are skills Lee has demonstrated since last May in his role as the conservative ruling party's floor leader. It was under his leadership that a highly controversial special compensation bill for the victims and bereaved families of last April's Hewol Hu Ferry passed the National Assembly earlier this year. In a meeting Friday afternoon, interim opposition party leader Moon Hee Sang cautioned the prime minister nominee to be aware that his role has changed. You were a good negotiating partner from the opposition party's point of view. Now you're no longer our negotiating partner. You'll be the subject of harsh criticism. The main opposition party stressed that it will thoroughly verify the nominee's abilities and qualifications at his confirmation hearing. 
A request for a confirmation hearing will be sent to the Assembly on Monday, and the hearing is expected to wrap up by mid-February at the latest. The nominee is expected to step down as Senori Party floor leader on Sunday. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Another precondition to holding reunions for families separated by the Korean War, North Korea wants South Korea to lift its sanctions against the regime. Seoul imposed the sanctions after North Korea torpedoed a South Korean warship back in 2010. The North's Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea said Friday that it's pointless to discuss inter-Korean exchanges because the sanctions are blocking exchanges between people. Seoul proposed a round of family reunions earlier this week, but Pyongyang has been sitting on the offer for more than two weeks. And North Korea is not going to be a happy camper hearing this news. The U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee plans to impose tougher sanctions on North Korea. Committee Chairman Ed Royce said Thursday that the committee will introduce its legislation on the sanctions to deprive the Kim Jong-un regime of hard currency. The decision follows a recent cyber attack on Sony, which the FBI has concluded that North Korea was behind. Royce introduced a similar bill last year, which passed the House, but failed to pass the Senate. The committee also seeks to expand sanctions on Iran to pressure the country to stop developing nuclear weapons. The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is thinking about taking up on Russia for their invitation for a special anniversary celebration in spring. And it looks like Pyongyang and Moscow are also stepping up efforts to improve their economic ties. With more, here's our Connie Kim. North Korea and Russia may be further boosting their economic ties. The South Korean daily, Joseon Ilbo, reported Friday that Pyongyang and Moscow are pushing to launch a 30 billion U.S. dollar project. Under the plan, Russia would rebuild North Korea's aging power grid and transmit electricity to the north. In exchange, North Korea would give Russia metals such as gold and copper. Experts say the New Deal would be a win for both countries. About 60 to 70 percent of North Korea's electricity is reportedly leaking from its power transmission facilities. And analysts say Russia will benefit by making use of natural resources that are under export sanctions by the European Union over the Ukraine crisis. Last year, the two countries agreed on a $25 billion project to repair the North's railways. North Korea and Russia's move toward greater economic cooperation comes amid signs of improving diplomatic ties between the two countries. On Wednesday, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un gave a positive signal to Russian President Vladimir Putin's invitation to an anniversary event in Moscow in May. If Kim accepts, it'll be the first time a North Korean leader has not chosen China as his first overseas destination since the Korean War. Insiders say, however, it'll take time for Pyongyang and Moscow to expand their bilateral ties. Economically, the trade volume between North Korea and China was 65 times larger than trade between Pyongyang and Moscow in 2013. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Let's start with some impressive numbers, one and a quarter trillion dollars. Yes, that's how much the European Central Bank plans to pump into financial markets in a desperate attempt to stop the flagging eurozone from shuddering to a halt. Our Shin Zemin tells us more. The European Central Bank says it's going to buy an unprecedented amount of bonds, pumping money into the stagnant eurozone economy. The central bank said Thursday that its purchases of government and private sector bonds worth 60 billion euros, or roughly 68 billion U.S. dollars, will begin in March and continue through at least September of next year, or even longer. The total will reach some 1.3 trillion dollars, much more than the 568 billion dollars initially expected. Speaking in Frankfurt on Thursday, ECB President Mario Draghi said the central bank would also keep eurozone interest rates at 0.05 percent. The decision comes as the eurozone is showing signs of growing into a deflationary spiral. It's hoped the massive stimulus will improve the bloc's sluggish exports and channel more investments into stocks. Not everyone is happy about the decision. German Chancellor Angela Merkel, for instance, wants countries like Greece and Italy to tighten their belts and stick to their original economic reforms.
Two things are part of this, a willingness to show solidarity, which we will continue to show, coupled with a willingness to take responsibility, which I am sure will continue to be shown by Greece. The ECB money will also include some existing programs. Greece will be included under a bailout program, but with some additional criteria, as such countries have worse economic conditions. The announcement stunned traders, with most markets across Europe posting gains. Stocks on Wall Street also reacted positively. On the currency markets, the euro slumped to an 11 year low of $1.13 against the greenback. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Well, the Korean economy grew at its slowest pace in more than two years mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter last year, setting off alarm bells among economic policymakers here in Korea who have been pouring all their efforts into trying to boost growth. Yes, and to tell us what's behind that slowdown and what we can expect going forward, our Hwang Jie joins us in the studio. Thanks for coming in today. Good to be here. Can you first break down the numbers for us? Sure. The Bank of Korea says the economy grew 0.4% in the fourth quarter from a quarter earlier. And that, as you said, marks the slowest growth in since the July to September period of 2012 and five straight quarters of growth below 1%. The central bank attributes the slowdown to a drop in exports hit by the slowing Chinese economy, which makes up 26% of all of Korea's exports. Due to sluggish exports, output in the manufacturing sector also contracted for two straight quarters in the October to December period last year. This is what we'll keep an eye on. And there's no good news on the domestic front either. Private spending grew a mere half a percent in the fourth quarter, slowing from the 1% growth posted in the previous quarter. Domestic consumption in 2014 grew 1.7 percent, the slowest pace since 2009 when Korea was hit by the global financial crisis. For all of last year, Korea grew 3.3 uh, percent, an uptick from the 3 percent growth in 2013, but far below the 4% range growth the bank forecast a year earlier. Okay. Well, but the central bank says there's nothing much to worry about. They're basically yeah. saying uh, the domestic economy is on a recovery track, and they're not very pessimistic about growth. So why is that, Jie? Well, that's true, and the BOK is pointing to some exceptional factors like a fall in government spending that dragged down construction investments by more than 9% in the fourth quarter from the previous one. And it also cited a new regulation on mobile phone subsidies that cut sales of handsets. Some experts also add on to the optimism, saying that the economic conditions abroad are likely to improve prove in the coming months giving a boost to the to Korea's traditional growth engine. And also uh, the low oil price will help to uh, boost the economy and uh, our trading partners such as China or EU uh, will benefit through the oil price and also EU uh, will grow with a more like a monetary expansion which is done today. So um, overall uh, economy uh, will, will improve in, in the first half of 2015. A high-level official at the finance ministry also says that Europe's latest stimulus measures uh, will benefit Korea, while the central bank governor says that uh, monetary easing has a limited impact on the domestic economy and the domestic financial market, as the move was widely expected. Then, Jia, does this mean that a rate cut to, I guess, further boost the economy is unlikely? Well, market expectations are still mounting over another rate cut in the first quarter this year, but with the belief that the central bank will work with the government to further spur growth. But recent remarks by the BOK governor show that the central bank might be taking a step back from the possibility of further rate cuts. He said the central bank will take time to gauge the impact of the two previous rate cuts uh, in the second half of last year while expressing concerns over the country's mounting household debt problem. Okay, Jay, thank you for helping us look into and around mm -hmm. the numbers and the speculation. Thank you for having me.
Daycare centers across the country will be under stricter regulations this year after a growing number of child abuse cases were reported in recent months. And the government will also increase financial support for moms and dads who decide to take care of their children at home. Our Kwanzaa has the details. With parents in shock following a string of child abuse cases at daycare centers in Korea, the government has decided to make installing CCTVs in child care facilities a must across the nation. There are already surveillance cameras at 7 out of 10 centers nationwide, but the government plans to raise the number to 8 this year and 9 next year. The law is expected to be passed in March as both the ruling and main opposition parties now see eye to eye on the issue after some previous disagreement about the installation of CCTVs. Also included in the law is a one strike out system that would shut down a daycare after one incident of child abuse. We will push ahead with reviewing the law at the National Assembly in February. The government is also looking into a revision of its financial support system for child care. Under the current system, people caring for their child at home get half the financial aid as those sending a child to a daycare center. That's why even full-time housewives use daycare, as they feel they would lose out if they didn't. But these days, with more women in the workforce, demand for the facilities is skyrocketing. We will monitor whether people are sending their children to child care centers when they don't need to, and if that is the case, we will make adjustments. Homemakers have reacted negatively toward the plan, saying it seems to undervalue non-working moms. The welfare ministry says it expected some controversy and will conduct surveys to come up with a more detailed plan by sometime around March. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And in the final part of our special series on startups here in Korea, I got a chance to sit down with Lee Hanju, founder of a global accelerator called Spark Labs, to discuss challenges ahead for startups. Now, this company has helped 30 startups to go global by linking them with Silicon Valley and other partners and also providing them funding, mentoring, and office space. Let's take a listen. The Korean economy uh, has a long tradition of uh, cooperation between the private sector and the government. In fact, a lot of the Chebors, if you look at their history, got their start because of the Korean uh, government support. However, what I see is that there's not enough support yet towards the early stage startups. And early stage startups are probably the riskiest form of investments. But it must be done because that's where the innovation and that's where the, all the excitement is and that's where the next 10 years of Korea will be defined by. I know the government is planning to do more. It's a matching program where private sector uh, VCs like us uh, make a selection and we say we're going to invest in this company and the government comes in and match, uh, do a matching program. So it's a co-investment. So I think that's a great idea mm -hmm. because the private sector guys are probably good at selecting the winning ideas and the government can bring their muscle and actually help to accelerate that growth. Then there must be some improvements that could be made though sure. in the current system to better help startups. So what's your Absolutely. opinion on that? Take one example of fintech. Uh, so fintech, it, it's, it's a short for financial tech. Um, probably the most famous example of that is PayPal um, or nowadays Alipay or you know what you see with uh, Apple 6, uh, iPhone 6 uh, with the Apple Pay. Uh, internet banking, a uh, lot of that you don't see in Korea yet and that's because of some of the uh, financial regulations that are in place but it's time to rethink those. Otherwise, Korea will be left behind. There's a huge revolution happening around the financial industry. Technology uh, revolutionizing uh, the way people pay, way people exchange money, uh, and that's a big business. You know, financial industry is a huge business, and Korea should not be left behind simply because we cannot imagine how to uh, redo the regulation. So I think uh, Korea needs to become really, really aggressive in terms of redoing the regulation around financial industry, so that uh, we could also have innovations around fintech. What? advice do you have for future startups mm -hmm. or for those considering to start one mm -hmm. but really can't because they don't really have that courage? Yeah. Just do it. Um, having gone through all those thought processes, uh, you know, you, there comes a time when you have to pull the trigger. I think we as a society needs to take a risk. For example, I think Korean moms need to be, become a little bit more tolerant of their kids 
trying a startup. Uh, working for big corporations is not the only uh, way for your children to succeed. Becoming a doctor and lawyer is not the only way for your kids to succeed. In fact, they can make a big difference by starting a startup. So do it, take risk, uh, but if you're going to do it, uh, do it with the right frame of mind. We shift our focus outside of Korea now. Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah, who had been ill from pneumonia and a lung infection, passed away at 1 a.m. on Friday. Saudi State TV said he would be succeeded by his half-brother, 79-year-old Prince Sulman, who had already begun to take on some of the king's responsibilities. King Abdullah was known as a leader who tried to modernize his very conservative society by providing more opportunities for the kingdom's women and its growing youth population. His passing comes at a challenging time for Saudi Arabia, the biggest oil producer in the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Oil prices jumped after the announcement. Futures advanced by 3 percent in New York and 2.6 percent in London. In Yemen, a major U.S. ally in the Middle East is now without a government or leader. Its president, along with the prime minister and cabinet, resigned on Thursday, leaving the government's opponents free to take the reins. Arkani Lee has more. After days of turmoil, Yemen is in even deeper chaos today. Its president stepped down on Thursday night, shortly after the prime minister and cabinet also called it quits. The resignations come a day after President Abed Mansur Rabu Hadi and the Shiite rebels known as Houthis signed a tentative peace deal. Under the deal, the Houthis, a minority group which has felt marginalized in the primarily Sunni country, agreed to pull their fighters out from government institutions in exchange for greater political power. However, even after the deal, the Houthis continued to occupy key parts of Yemen, including the president's residence, which was seized on Tuesday. The country, now without a leader, is of great concern to the United States and its allies. Yemen has been a key ally in the fight against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is, according to Western intelligence, the most dangerous branch of al-Qaeda. The group recently made headlines after claiming responsibility for the killings in Paris at the offices of French magazine Charlie Hebdo. On Thursday, the U.N. envoy to Yemen has called on the rival groups in Yemen to uphold the earlier agreement to share power and to avoid the violence. I call you all to have wisdom and national spirit, give priority to the national interests of Yemen, and use dialogue and political action to resolve any of political disagreement away from violence, extortion, and procrastination. The U.S. has also responded by reducing its embassy staff there due to safety concerns and said it's still assessing what a leaderless Yemen means for the West. However, the State Department added that its top priority in Yemen remains as the effort to fight terrorism. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now the weather, did you know that unless you're living in the South mm -hmm. Pole, it is quite common for you to contract food poisoning or the norovirus or the common cold? No, even during winter. I did not know that because I don't get sick too often. I noticed. No, not going to. Okay. But <laughs> I want to stay that way. I don't want to get sick. No one wants to get sick. And for detailed information and tips on keeping the illness away, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle? Good evening to you and Daniel. Many people don't think you can get food poisoning during the winter, but surprisingly, there's about 45% chance that you'll get an infection during this time of the year since the virus can survive longer in low temperatures. Now, so make sure to take precautions by keeping your hands and utensils clean and sterile so that you can stay healthy throughout the rest of the season. Now looking at the weather, it looks like we're nearly at the end of winter because tomorrow we're expecting much, much clearer skies with milder highs, but we are also expecting some rain to fall on Sunday uh, evening here in Seoul, which will then expand nationwide on Monday. Now going over to our readings for tomorrow, so we'll start off the Saturday morning at negative 2 and gets up high at 7 degrees, while Daegu and Busan will top out at 10 and 11 degrees respectively. 
Now to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 8, Tokdo hits 12, while Nankungang dips low to negative 3 degrees. That's all for now, Michelle Park, and I hope you have a wonderful Friday evening. All right, for those of you here in Korea, enjoy those clear skies. And like Michelle said, wash your hands often. All right, Daniel? I will remember okay. that. Okay, thanks for watching. I'm Lee Ji-yoon. And I'm Daniel Che, wishing you a great weekend. We'll be back with more next week.